Hello, viewers, and welcome back. Fingers crossed. Looks like I may be going back to Guadalcanal in September this year. So I'm filming this in February 2023. So I'm hoping to get back for a week in September. Um, there, I plan to uh, do some on the ground filming, especially covering this second Marine Raiders uh, long patrol, the 30 day patrol they, um, they conducted. So I did some preliminary uh, research there a couple of years ago, especially with a place called Asamana, which is a, a good battle they fought in. Um, I'm not going to walk the whole 30 mile trek. I wish I could, but I don't have the time and probably the, uh, the fitness as I used to, but I'm going to cover the main sections of it. So yeah, that and a number of other um, items on my agenda uh, when I get back. So I'll keep you guys updated. So what I want to share with you today, um, when I was on Guadalcanal, I made a number of research videos and generally I made them so um, I could go back and, and view them and, and try to narrow down the spots and places and, and verify things. So this one I made, and I was looking at it the other day, and I thought I'd share it with you. It basically concerned the Japanese pocket uh, during the Battle of Henderson Field. Now, as some of you guys know, if you watch some of my videos and I think heard my me on a few podcasts and talking about it, the Japanese in the largest assault um, on the island, they hit this line, this southern line held by the uh, Marines and U.S. Army, or basically with the division, the second Sendai division. Their plan was to go on both sides of the Lunga River and up and over Bloody Ridge to replicate that September attack. But due to the, the terrain and the communication and a number of other factors, they were pushed to the right, which is the east side. They end up attacking in the thick jungle at the base of Bloody Ridge, eastern slope, and the Coffin Corner area. And then this one you had the famous uh, U.S. Marine John Bassalon, Chesty Puller, a number of good fights in that area. But the Japanese, um, under the 29th Regiment, one of their best regiments, by the way, um, hopefully I don't butcher this guy's name, he's the regimental commander, uh, Colonel Fury Mia, Fury Mia, hopefully I say that right. So he was the, the colonel in the regimental commander, 29th. So himself and his color guard, carrying the uh, regimental colors, made a penetration through the line. Um, and this penetration depends on which vet and which accounts you speak to in the, the official records, it was about 150 yards uh, wide and about 100 yards deep. They overran a couple of Marine machine gun post, bunker positions, and, and they dug in. So this, this was on the, the 24th and the 25th, so early morning or late night, early morning, 24th and 25th, during their, their first assault. Um, so throughout that next morning, the Marines uh, did a number of counterattacks and basically wiped out the pocket. Uh, they end up recovering those two Marine uh, machine guns, recovered three more Japanese machine guns, and accounted a total of like 37 to 40 Japanese bodies. The rest of the Japanese dispersed, including the 29th, um, 29th commander, um, Fury Mia. So Fury Mia and about 10 guys escaped. And they were on the run for a number of days. And how do we know that? Because he wrote it down in the diary. There's a couple of accounts how this diary came to um, be in the U.S. possessions. One, that they found the colonel's body after he committed suicide. And another account says the colonel had wrote the extensive note, gave it to a young lieutenant, and said, make your way back to um, the Japanese lines. Well, I tend to believe that one more. And here's, here's my account of my attack. But anyway, in his diary, he made a lot of, um, uh, uh, I guess, um, observations. And at one stage, he was only about 10 meters away from the Americans in bunkers. At one stage, he said the bunkers, machine guns, would just fire sporadically. He thought the Americans might have had electronic sensors, that, motion sensors, and that the machine guns automatically fire. But, you know, that wasn't the case. But the Japanese didn't, didn't think that. In fact, some of the Japanese thought the the Americans had electronic sensors in the ground, motion sensors that detected them before they arrived, and artillery could come down on their heads if, if the Marines only had that. But he um he ended up uh, cutting the colors up and burying them because we obviously couldn't burn them because it would draw attention. But he made a he, he basically took all blame for the attack himself, and he made one um, I guess 
obser big observation. He basically said, I have to read it. Um, he apologized for assault and he said, don't overlook the firepower of the Americans. So that was his big take on all this. Don't overlook the American firepower, which you think the Japanese would have would have um, worked that out already. And this was the third major assault on the island. You think the first couple of assaults, um, they would have worked that out. But anyway, I'll share this uh, video with you. Um, I don't know if I can't say 100 percent this is the exact spot, but you'll see in the video there was a number of evidence, uh, pieces of evidence, which which um, I worked out in my head. Uh, it was. I'll stop the video at certain times and maybe I'll do some comment. And actually film this, and I, I said at the very beginning, um, you'll hear in October, which is around the same time frame the actual battle uh, took place. It's Saturday, 27th of October, 2018, 843. Bush is looking southward. There's a small knoll on the eastern spur. Bloody Ridge. There's some evidence um, I've gathered so far in the location this little knoll is. I think it might be the uh, site of, Jap of a Japanese penetration or possibly a Japanese holdout. Um, it was reported in the October battle that on the first night in you know, 17 lines uh, there was some Japanese that was getting through the lines. In fact, when Baslon, who won the Medal of Honor, um, basically stated that when he left his bunker he had to fight through the Japanese which were actually behind him at the time to get back to an ammunition point. Now you're looking at the reverse slope. I'll walk up to the actual knoll itself. I'm starting to see uh, once the natives are starting to clear the vegetation here you'll see a small bunker in front of us. The bunker hole would have been one of the rear bunkers. We'll walk up on the the knoll itself. Top of the knoll. We're coming to a actual track. This is the original track the Marines used. We'll sit facing west there. Pan across the top of the ridge. We'll sit facing east. The spur directly in front about 12 o'clock is the last spur before it goes down the slope into the jungle of the eastern ridge. Now that top spur was the site of some fighting. I found a lot of um, empty cartridges in there and when you actually go down the slope the jungle flat at the bottom within probably 100 yards is the uh, bass mount positions where some machine guns are at. Now on the forward slope here Thick jungle growth, but if I was to walk in the jungle, you'd see every about 10 15 yards of marine machine gun bunkers and foxholes. And that would have been the front line. In fact, it was the front line September 1942 all the way to January 1943. Now, you heard me say there was, if I was walking down that front slope, there's a couple of marine machine gun uh, positions. I think these are the two machine gun positions that the Japanese refer it was referred to. They overran and killed the uh, the Americans into this. Now, this is the last knoll on the eastern slope of Buddy Ridge. Now, if you look now, you can see in the distance there that's that's the main spine, uh, north south spine of Bloody Ridge. Can't see it that well, but um, just picture Bloody Ridge uh, like in a T section, and this is the the left T uh, coming that I'm standing on now. So I'm thinking the Japanese, especially coming out at night, they hit that thick jungle, nice and flat. They knew their objective was the first hill. That was the 29th objective, was the first hill. I think as soon as they come out of that thick jungle, they seen the ridge to their left. And they said, this is the ridge, this is the ridge. And this is the first little knoll that I'm standing on now. And I'm thinking the Japanese um, came out, because I've been in this jungle at night looking up. You can see the silhouette of this, this hill. You can see how it stands out. So I think they hooked the left, um, that company did, and, and got up on this knoll because they knew that was their rally point, their first objective point. And I think they, they went here waiting for the other Japanese to come. That's just my theory. And I can't can't verify it. Absolutely. 
We're finding fired and unfired air soccer rounds, which are Japanese rifle rounds. Um, a fired, possibly eight millimeter Nambu pistol round. Japanese hand grenade fragments. And just today I found what the locals have been clearing the garden. They tossed it aside. It was the top of a Japanese gas mask um, respirator, metal respirator. So the Japanese, I wish the jungle was clear. You can see better. You'll see the end of the ridge there in the jungle. The Japanese pinning that down. Base in front of us, heading toward fighter strip one. The main um, road basically on the north south axis. That was called the Sector 3 track. So I think when the Japanese penetrated through, and this is in the middle of the night after a heavy thunderstorm, they have to say they're fairly disorientated. They'd go through in 10, 15, um, 20 man groups. So what I believe they did, if this was a scene of some fighting, instead of coming off the ridge there, they would have come through the jungle flat around the the bottom of the ridge and into this flat and probably attack straight up this little slope. Um, I fired or I found a number of fired 30 out six cartridges here too. A lot of artillery shrapnel. US mainly 75s. I know the it was reported that the commander of the 29th Japanese Infantry Regiment, I forgot his name, actually penetrated through Behind the lines, I don't know how far back, but a group of about 50 men. And they held out um, to bed the next day. Then they were in a small pocket, then they were eventually uh, wiped out. Just like I said at the beginning of the um, this episode, uh, since I've got uh, further information that it was uh, from a number of sources, roughly about 100 uh, Japanese. So I don't know if the colonel was actually with this small group. Uh, reported he was, and he ended up breaking away. And um, while I've still this, you can see that, see that nice flat area there? This area here only was in 2018, actually opened up for the first time in since 1943. This whole area was just full of bunkers and bunker holes. So this is all reverse slope here. And you've seen some of some other videos. Uh, finding, I think there was one finding uh, bunkers on Edson's Ridge or Bloody Ridge. They yeah, are going a lot of detail. We'll see one of my friends probably can't see him. He's in the middle there. This is his garden. This is um little little crop he's digging away. The, the back slope and the downward slope. That's full of um fox holes. Locals are about to clear it. I believe this whole slope was clear during the time. This is the largest uh, flat area in the whole reverse slope. So I think this might have been a side of a lot of activity. First aid post, supply points, possibly a lot of command posts. I know during the battle, there was a ported puller, had a field phone on the reverse slope. So possibly it could be right here. All right, viewers, hope you enjoyed that. And just a short um, uh, video. Once again, look at my other videos if you want to know about the Battle of Coffin Corner. Um, the John Bassalone, Medal of Honor, all features the, um, the Battle of Henderson Field. So I hope you enjoy it, and fingers crossed, I'm going to Guadalcanal very soon. See you.